grace to you and peace from God our Father, Christ Jesus, His Son, our Lord, who is the only resurrection and life. Amen. Amen. As I mentioned to the children, every now and then you get the passage from the Gospels. It doesn't sound like the Gospel in the narrow sense. You know, it's not the best news that you can possibly hear about the end times, about what we are to face as God's people. And yet, when it ends, the ones who endure to the end shall be saved. We know that the endurance is not based upon our own strength. In the little children's hymn of the little white one from way back when, you remember that song about Jesus' little ones? We are weak, but he is strong. Oh, yeah. Is it ever my own strength which stands up against the powers of this world? No. I can barely stand up against the powers of my own flesh sometimes. You, know? <laughs> you get up in the morning and you wonder, you know, that's the miracle of old age. Oh, well, I'm, I, I got up again. <laughs> yeah. Ugh, but with a creepy back. Your knees are stiff from me, not moving all night long. But when it comes against the powers of this world, we will hear of nations warring against nations. We hear about that, don't we? What has happened in the last few years? Actually, I should say in the last 22 years? What was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan? We sent in there Enormous numbers of troops. And we lost so many young men and young women. And many others came back crippled from those improvised explosive devices, having lost legs, both feet. And what have we accomplished through all of that? We lost. Because what has happened is we are actually in those last days, and already, almost 500 years ago, what did Martin Luther say about the Muslim? He said, the Muslim are the swarms of locusts that have been released from the depths of the abyss, the foretelling that the devil is coming back as the dragon. And if you're not willing to fight the dragon on the terms of religion, but simply going against him using his tools, violence, he will always win. The only way to conquer wickedness is not with violence, but with the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. The most interesting conversion to Christianity that I ever heard was several years ago. Some Christians were being rounded up. They're always being rounded up. And 20 young men were lined up along a ditch, ready to have their heads cut off. And one of the young men reached inside his coat and he pulled out a book and he handed it to his head and with a smile, he said, keep this. And then he bent over and waited. And he was beheaded. That book was a New Testament in Arabic. The headsman read it. Two years later, he ran away, and he is now a Christian. This man's giving of his life on earth, earning him the crown of life in paradise, won another person into the family of God. How many people in these United States are willing to do that sort of thing? Are we such strong Christians that we will die for our Lord? We need to be. We have to be. Because sooner or later, the devil will be coming here. We already see 
that oppression of Christianity is going on in these United States. The mockery is almost reaching the point of intolerance. And so we are afraid. And so many Christians and go with the flow. And they pretend to laugh along even though they're hurting inside. But we see this sort of behavior happen generation after generation. But in ours, it seems to be worse. And what we need to consider when we do such things is we are one body in Christ. Not just Lutherans, Christians in every pew throughout the entire world, even those, uh, those confessional groups, those denominations whose official teachings are a little weird, still, in the pews, you're going to find true Christians. So we call the inconsistent, for fortuitous inconsistency. They will be there. On the other hand, you can have the most doctrinally correct group of people in the world and have people in the pews who've never heard the name of Jesus in their hearts. These are the ones that we know of that will say to the Lord, have you not said in your name, Lord, Lord? And Jesus will say to them, oh, truly, I never knew you. We cannot see God's invisible church. We can just take it for granted and give everyone the benefit of the doubt that the people who are our brothers and sisters in confession are our brothers and sisters in the faith. And if we treat them that way and continue that way in life, will they be our brothers and sisters? There's every possibility. Because what's the one thing that overcomes rot and the wickedness of this world? Love, mercy, kindness. And so when one person behaves inappropriately, we understand what's meant when Jesus says, and the scriptures write, against you and you only have I sinned. Even though we have sinned against one another and we have sinned against whoever, we bring the sin into the body of Christ and therefore we sin against Christ who is the head. And so, that's why we have the corporate confession. We confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean. It is not enough for us to say, I am sinful and unclean, because we are a body. We are one bride of Jesus Christ. We are one, we make up one holy building, one temple. And we as his people then are to do what? Seek after his righteousness and all other things shall follow after. And we have to remember one another, just as is written in the scriptures, I remember without ceasing your faith, your labor of love, the patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, looking forward to his coming again to redeem us from this world. But that faith needs to be active. The very first pastor to whom, under whom I was baptized, he used to call Lutherans gimme pigs. Because so many of us just sit in the pews and go, gimme grace, gimme grace, gimme grace, gimme grace. But we don't do anything with the grace which is poured out upon us. What happens when Jesus pours his love into your hearts? And if you pour it back out at someone else, does he ever fail to fill it back up again? He is the one who has that measure where he tamps it down and smooths it off and tamps it again and adds a little bit more just to make sure. No matter how much we pour out upon other people, we always have a full heart of Jesus' love and mercy. And perhaps the more we do it, we might say, the more fresh is that supply. Because we know that what he has given to us has not been in vain. And so we endure, 
by doing what is good and right in this world, most especially to those who are against us. That we stand up for those who are our brothers and sisters, and we stand up against those with kindness, those who seek our downfall. They can't stand that. Pray for your enemies because it pours a heaping pile of hot coals upon their heads. That's a passage that's so hard to understand, except other than this. When you pray for people who don't like you, it ticks them off. <laughs> but then they have to wonder, how come they're praying for my good when I'm praying for their destruction? And then you have an answer. It's because Jesus had every reason in the world to come down and destroy every last one of us. But instead, he gave himself that we might be delivered. He gave himself so that you would not have to go after some false god and try and prove that yourself, prove to this god that you're good. Because let's face it, deep down inside, you know that you're not that good, are you? We all have to admit that. But despite this, what has Jesus done? He gave the very last measure, pouring himself out in every way. I want to make a comment. Veterans Day weekend, isn't it? How many soldiers have you known in your life? How many of you have served in the military? or no, have family who served in the military. And why is there popcorn going on? <laughs> okay, in any case, these men, these women, when they went out, they gave the very last measure of what they could in standing up for what? Truth, justice, and the American way. Better than Superman, because these are real, honest, just people who could actually be harmed. Who could actually die. And still they stood up for these things. Why? Because from the beginning, this truth, this justice, the American way, has been the epitome of, at the beginning, the foundation was based upon what? Religious freedom and the ability and the freedom to love God without the interference of other people, especially government entities. The United States of America was founded on the ideal that every man can have, and woman can have their own relationship with Jesus Christ directly. And you need not have fear of how people are going to criticize you on this. Now, it doesn't say that things didn't happen here in the United States and shouldn't have. Most certainly they did. But being able to stand up and to worship freely became so important that of the uh, 13 original colonies, after the Constitution of these United States was written, seven of them would not ratify it until the Bill of Rights was, was added. And what's included in number one? The freedom to practice religion. It was so important to these states, many of which now are just at the opposite end of it, so ironic, that now the United States was based upon the foundation that Jesus is Lord. And most people will not recognize that. They won't admit it anymore. But that is where we are. And yet we can bring back that simply by being who we are. There are still enough true Christians in these United States that if we stood up and proclaimed that Jesus is the only Lord, we would make enough noise that the media could not possibly, possibly cancel all of us. They couldn't do it. And that is our witness. Because when we are hauled up to be canceled, 
Who gives us a voice? It is not our words, but the words of the Holy Spirit that speaks through our hearts. And cannot these words be simple words that convince, that persuade? Because where is the power? Is the power in me, you, any of us? Even prayer, does prayer have power? No. The big thing is, we have a God who listens to them, and he does all things. And when we are put into a position where we are under stress and duress, and we don't know what to say, that is why we have the Holy Spirit that cries in our hearts when we can't say anything other than, ah. Isn't that what it's written? He, the Spirit prays for us when we do not know what to pray. And he speaks for us when we know not what we say. We have always, since Jesus ascended into heaven, been at the beginning of the end time. But now, I'm persuaded, we're getting closer and closer to those days. Now, Martin Luther, he thought he was pretty close. This is almost 500 years ago. And he said... We can look around us and we can say the world is worse today than it was a generation before. And yet everyone around him were Christians. Except for the Turks who were trying to invade from the east. What would he say about our world today? <clears throat> can we say that we live in a, a neighborhood that is 100% Christian? No. In a city? Never. In a nation, by no means. And yet, as a people, are we still of one heart, one mind, and one Savior, one hope, one Lord Jesus Christ? We are. And so we are scattered, but we are one. One. And there is no power in heaven or earth that can overcome that one. Because what the Father has put into the hands of his Son, no one can snatch away. For his Father is greater than all. And we are in the hands of Jesus Christ, whether we know it or not. And so he calls upon us to stand our ground as Christians and to take, fight the good fight with mercy. To fight the good fight with kindness. To fight the good fight even unto death. And why? Because we have nothing to lose. We have nothing to fear. Because God shall never abandon us to the grave. But he shall deliver us from this place into paradise where there will be enormous trees growing with chili dogs. That's my favorite. And there will be pizza bushes. Yes. And there will be trees so strange and growing every possible fruit all at once. And then for little bad children, there will be, I don't know, cauliflower over there. <laughs> yes. But that's a lot of weight for us to worry about having to stand up. And yet, blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake, for so also they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We are the saints of God. We are his witnesses in this world. And we make all the difference. Because even though he knows how weak we are, how frail we are, how afraid we are of everything that might go on around us. He did not hesitate to turn over his holy ministry to our care, to go out into the world and do what? Proclaim everything that he has taught us. And everything he has taught us is not the law. It's to love the Lord our God with all of our mind, heart, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. And who is our neighbor? Everyone. And may the peace of God that goes beyond all understanding fill our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.